Do you want the, hold the other microphone. Yeah. About the laundry. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to solve this before I get to my script. He doesn't seem to understand that that's just something that needs to get done. <laughs> Sometimes he'll be like, okay, well, let's do our own thing this afternoon. You can go do your thing, laundry or whatever. I'm like, that's what I do when I'm, I'm done with all the stuff I'm supposed to do. So it's become a running joke that he doesn't seem to get it, that the laundry is not my hobby. <laughs> it's just a thing. <laughs> He's right about the olives, though. <laughs> I have spent an unhealthy amount of time this weekend thinking about that video. There is a curse on going Sunday morning. You get to stew and worry and wonder. That's what I do. And uh, since I'm the country cousin out in Ellicott, I didn't know who they were going to get. So. I didn't know if they were gonna, you know, round up people at the main campus that recognized my mugshot, or like, I, I, I didn't know who they were gonna get, so I was a little worried, but I should have known better. I was already gonna say what an amazing job uh, Shannon had done. Um, I think you've probably all done the math on how many, I, I, it had to have been 100 or more hours of video editing to do yeah. that, so thank you so much for all of that. night that I uh, I think she could have been a professional writer for some sort of like sitcom or yeah. like anything like she's just that <coughs> gifted and she's given it to the Lord uh, mm -hmm. for us so what a blessing thank you so much this is gonna take a while um, this sort of looks like carrot top with all my you know pulling out all my props and uh, they made me get out of the room by 11 come on <laughs> I did not blame for that. Uh, this is the most important thing, otherwise I will ramble this whole time until Jenna drags me off of the stage. So that's our most important thing. Okay, I think I've had <laughs> And the clicker. <laughs> All right. Well, in conclusion. <laughs> highlights been so far? Just take a second and tell your neighbor what your highlights been. I think, I think the afterglow last night. Like I've lesson to learn. So, I had left a blank on my paper so I could, you know, figure out what it was and not come up with something fake. And um, it's the sisters in the fellowship. Um, I've had so many people uh, tell me they're praying for me and people just praying for me. Um, just seeing, oh, so many Ellicott sisters. Mm -hmm. um, just this massive collection of women of the Lord. Like, this is just the fellowship is terrific. I haven't met a stranger yet, so mm -hmm. it's just been really beautiful. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I started uh, at the Central Campus in 2015, and then we moved out to the Ellicott Campus when it opened, because it's five minutes from our house, and that's uh, really hard to beat. Um, and, oh, I wanted to point out that um, Jenna, my Kleenex are on my left, so I brought a box. <laughs> they're on the left, and then I'll put the dirty ones here on the right <laughs> side. <laughs> I'm going to use your system. <laughs> but my new pants didn't have any pockets. I like so it. I got a new system. <laughs> um, so this is one of my happiest places. And uh, as long as I've been coming here, um, Lisa Beach, which I, I haven't seen her this weekend. Mm -hmm. Daughter's well, wedding. okay, that's her daughter's getting married. We'll give her a pass. 
but she's always been um, either a presenter or an MC, and she set the bar really high by handing out presents. Yeah. Yeah. And so I will not be outdone. I'm going to hand out presents. Wow. Here, here's the difference, though. Lisa Beach, even though we share the same name, she's sort of the classy, trendy, happy kind of Lisa. I'm more of the nerd kind of Lisa. <laughs> And so Lisa handed out trendy and classy and happy presents. I'm handing out nerd presents. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to I was afraid I might be the only one. Okay, so uh, the first one, uh, nerds like games. And my husband and I have found this amazing two-person game. It goes really fast, but it's highly addictive. Uh, so if you've got, if you, oh, okay, so unexpected uh, technical difficulty. That's why Missy's here to help me. Um, I have two of those, and if you've got, if they're glued person, together. Maybe it's two-person games. Maybe it's just you and one other person in your house. Any takers? Anybody want that? I saw the red there, um, right there, and it's uh, oh, is that Stephanie? Yep. So, and you, if you can come up and grab those from Missy, sorry, Missy, I didn't know these were still connected. And this is very exciting. My nerves. Oh. oh, it's called Blink, and it goes really fast. It's really great. Oh. Okay. This is really exciting. Nerds like. Pens. Um, that sounds strange to some of you, but you can hear from the crowd that I'm not the only one. My husband was the original pen nerd, and he's got me turned on to it. I have 14 Interjet, uh, Pentel Intergel pens, um, and these are special edition colors. So these are your regular Daddy's Pentel Intergels. Um, if there's a couple of pen nerds in the overflow room, head this way so that there's a fair chance. And then um, I'm going to just turn this situation over to Missy. <laughs> For the first 14 who want to admit you're a pen nerd, come on up. And uh, let's, if there's anybody in the overflow room, I want to make sure they get some. <laughs> We shouldn't. We, we all would love a pen, but we won't take a pen, Lisa. No, we're letting it be for all but, the other nerds. But good job, and when you watch this, you are fantastic, and you're doing a great job. You are, and we love you so much. I'm so excited right now. Pens are exciting. Yes, exciting. <laughs> Special edition colors. My husband almost took this. This is no joke. He was like, we don't have those colors. And it almost took part in the giveaways. <laughs> the next thing you're going to like to do is to write. Yes. And I have always um, written out my quiet time, my Bible study time, I just filled notebooks. And then my beloved husband, oh, see, this is what I was afraid of. So, so what do I point at? <laughs> is that <little> quick? <laughs> Okay, now I'm just making noise. I'm pushing all the buttons now so it might start singing. I'll take it. I'll take it. Hallelujah. It's better than any gift I can give you. Okay, so there was the blank See, this is what I was Okay, and then my husband, this is the pen nerd family, he gave me a new, different purple pen every day of June until my birthday. That's the kind of pen nerds we, we, we have. I love that. It's so fun. Okay, so I do the little writing thing in the journal and the Bible study and all that. Um, and uh, then my husband made me a blog. So I actually got to capture all my thoughts in my blog. It's called Palomas.ink. Um, and so it's been my joy, and it's been a lot of fun to do that. Um, and so I have a journal for some inspiring writer, 
It's got it's beautiful. It's got a passage a day and room to write. Mm, wow. So if you've got maybe an aspire, inspiring writer at home or maybe a, a child that needs some prompting or maybe you need some prompting, um, we have a, a writing journal. Missy, whoever catches your eye. Missy oh, got wow. off the hand. So hard. Journals. And then my last gift. Um, nerds like to read and write, as I said. We did the writing, and now the reading. Um, my favorite book, uh, one of my favorite Aww. books, Velveteen Rabbit. I had not read this book till I was 19 years old. Aww. Sobbed like a baby. <laughs> I, I still sob like a baby when I read this book. This is the 100th year edition. It, um, the original book was given to me by my bi biological brother shortly after I met him for the first time. And so if I have an adopted mom or a foster mom, I saw a hand put in the back, uh, third, maybe third row, second row, second row. Yeah. Um, yes. This is a hundredth edition. Okay. One more slide. This is my cat, Princess. She's a nerd, too. I had a cat nerd gift, but it didn't. Amazon didn't get it to me in time. So our picture is to look at the pretty kitty. Yeah. All right. Oh, that's, I actually have a couple little gifts at the end. Um, we'll come back to those because uh, they will be funnier when you see them at the end. Um, let's go ahead and transition the rest of our time together in prayer. And I'll try not to break it. Yeah. Slide it over, yeah. Um, Heavenly Father, it's with awe and trembling that we come before you to your throne room of grace. Mm -hmm. I lift each of these women to you, Lord, and beg you to search each heart. Change us here on earth as we prepare for eternity. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, please convict each one of us that we would leave here changed, committed to obedience and dependence on you. And Jesus, we humbly offer our hallelujah to you. Mm -hmm. You made this all possible through your own obedience to the cross and through the resurrection. Please speak through me, setting aside any agenda or words that are not from you. Speak to each woman in a way they would know it was from you and that each uh, would have a clear call to action as a transition from this holy retreat back to our lives down the mountain in all things, at all times. We pray for your will and that you would be glorified. In the precious name of our Savior, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Sunday morning, ladies. What a blessing. Uh, what a privilege uh, to retreat to this beauty and the seclusion of the mountain. All while we must know that we have to prepare to transmission back to our daily lives. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to transfer what we've been hearing and seeing and feeling and learning into something that leaves us changed for eternity for the Lord. Something that will be with us a year from now and a year from that. Um, let's reflect on some of the big ideas that the other speakers stole from me. I mean, I mean, the Holy Spirit has reinforced in my presentation after the day also. Here's the Praise the words. Lord. Praise. Mm -hmm. Remember praise? Faith. A palate. And a need for a change of a palate. God's patience. Trust. Doing. Spiritual gifts. Just do it. And serious sin. Mm -hmm. Those are some big words to, to start our trip down the mountain. This morning is the call to action of the weekend. This is the be holy as I am holy. Uh -oh. I'm not sure what that is. Did I just... Uh oh, shoot. <laughs> that was Shannon's picture of her. I hope no. she didn't see it. I think she saw it. Am I waiting for it? Or... Okay. All right, uh, so this morning is our call to action. Be holy as, as he is holy. Yikes. That's quite a call to action. Okay. I'm going to start with my conclusion, then we can work backwards to explore how we take all of what we've learned this weekend about pursuing holiness. First, the Holy Spirit convicts us to be holy. And then he gives us the power um, and spiritual blessing to actually be holy. To live in the Spirit is both obedience to and dependence on the Holy Spirit. 
there's a balance between our wills. And women have strong wills. And we express those through our obedience. And our faith, which we express by our dependence. Um, and then uh, our journey into the holy harvest will include why to pursue holiness, what specific area of our life or sin to pursue holiness in, and how to pursue holiness in that area of our lives. Um, it seems like such an impossible call to action sometimes, maybe not while we're here, surrounded by the view and all these amazing women of God, but what about work on Monday? and the things that crush in, and the kids, and the family, and the chores, and all the things. We better know why we, we would even try to do this seemingly impossible thing. First, an obvious reason is, he said so. <laughs> Just like we tell our kids, because I said so. <laughs> and also because he is holy, and can only be reconciled to us if we're holy in Christ. So the first reason to pursue holiness is because we aren't given another option. <clears throat> Another reason to pursue holiness found in the final chapter of our um, theme book by Jerry Bridges is joy. It's a beautiful chapter and he makes a great case. I recommend that you read it. There are many other reasons to be holy, but I want to explore a Sunday morning heading home for the retreat reason to be holy. And in a word, it's purpose. Amen. Let me start with a passage that you all know very well. And the danger being, you'll assume you know it well enough to tune out, but I beg you to listen as if this is a new story. Shanna even quoted from this Friday night. Matthew uh, 26, 33 through 54. I think that's on the slide. Yes. I have different glasses for up close and, and away, so this will be fun to see if I <laughs> fall on that step trying to see that, that uh, slide right there. Matthew 26, 33 through 54. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die for you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he came back, and he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left and went away more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look. The hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of the sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came to do, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for a sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Weird. <laughs> put your sword, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it says it must happen this way? We know from John chapter 18 that the companion that drew the sword and cut off the ear of the high priest was Peter. Simon Peter. What does this passage tell us about why to pursue holiness? 
I'm going to read verses 52 and 53 again. Put your sword back in his place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus knew he could call on his father and have 12 legions of angels to fulfill whatever purpose he had. He was in the final hours of his ministry and his freedom, and he was facing unimaginable pain, suffering, and loss. What did he want with those 12 legions of angels? Apparently, despite the power and might they could bring in this terrible circumstance, he had no purpose for them in the story at all. In all four Gospels, we have this story, so we have a pretty good idea of the events. No angel purpose. What did Jesus actually want in the last hour of his ministry? Here's a review of the highlight reel. Sit here while I go and pray. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Couldn't you men keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What Jesus wanted was the support of his friends in his times of trouble. These disciples, and Peter in particular, had been given a clear purpose it hurts me to think how much it hurt Jesus' heart. Have you ever been let down, betrayed, abandoned when you were sorrowful? Maybe we can sympathize with the disciples for fleeing when the mob came. But they did this before. And it makes me think it probably hurt his heart more. I suspect the real reason Peter struck that high priest assistant Failure stings. He woke up from a nap after he said he was going to die for his Savior. And he had let Jesus down. What's the point? What does this tell us about the pursuit of holiness? For the answer to that, let's all say together a very common verse, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You have a purpose. And it's not just good works, but it's good works prepared beforehand just for you. When you head down this mountain, you have a purpose just for you. One motivation to understand this pursuit of holiness and the role of the Holy Spirit in that pursuit is that we don't want to be Simon Peter in Gethsemane, cutting off limbs when all that was asked of us was to sit and pray with a troubled friend. Mm. <clears throat> See if this sounds familiar to you. I used to cringe when men would say, I'd die for you. <laughs> Great. Human Kevlar, very helpful. <laughs> It's a nice sentiment, and maybe even true. <laughs> but I wasn't interested in getting married to anyone until I found the one who would be more focused on living alongside me. And you saw him. <laughs> As you head down the mountain, the same is true for you. While it's possible one or more of you might be asked to give your life for Christ, more probable for most of us, those good works pre prepared beforehand will include shining your light in the workplace, or fulfilling your duties as a spouse, a parent, an adult child, or one of the many other roles we have in our lives down that hill. Serving those in need, inside our church, and out. Sometimes we long for a story to be grand, defending the Lord with the sword. Take that, people on social media I disagree with. <laughs> we all long to be the MVP, the hero, the award winner, big swings, big accomplishments. But what we should be asking ourselves is, what is God's purpose for me right now? What is God's purpose for me in this season of my life? Maybe God is actually asking you to sit with a struggling friend in a garden, or patience with a struggling child, or submission to a struggling husband. Think about the actual purposes of some of the... Did I just go... Yeah, I'm good. I'm back. Good call. Uh, <laughs> think about the actual purposes of a few of the people in the Bible. The sinful woman, no name, in Luke who washed Jesus' feet and poured perfume on him. Deborah had to encourage a struggling leader. 
Then Chael had to finish the job with the same struggling leader by using a Ted stake and hammer, which were used in her routine chores as nomadic life. <laughs> the owner of Donkey, who, when he heard that the Lord has use of it, Dooner Dude with Pitcher, <laughs> who had a room for the large group to celebrate the Passover. Shamgar, a rancher using the tools of his trade to accomplish miracles in God's hands. <laughs> Can you tell where a judge is out in Ellicott? <laughs> There's lots of judges references on that list. <laughs> uh, but not a lot of superpowers and not even a lot of proper names. Just faithful folks using the tools of their trade, the gifts they have been given to fulfill their purpose in Christ. Amen. That's how we arrive at our pursuit of holiness with obedience to and dependence on the Holy Spirit. We cannot fulfill our designed purpose without him. I know what you may be thinking, because I'm thinking the same thing. Of course I want to be holy. Of course I want to fulfill my purpose, the good works created for me before time. Of course I want to let my light shine before men that they may see my good works and glorify the Father in heaven. But how? I have great news for you. There is a way. Okay. All right. Uh, what to pursue. But before we talk about how, let's talk about, let's be super clear about the what we will each be pursuing towards. If we're honest, we're at a church retreat and we try and put our best foot forward and that's fine. I'm not suggesting any of you go back to the room and play truth or dare. Um, <laughs> but before we go any further, it is essential for you to consider and hopefully identify at least one specific area of your life where you can make a plan to pursue holiness. Paul, for goodness sake, Paul tells us that when he wants to do good, evil is nearby, ready to offer a helping hand. Paul did a lot of really good things, but it was a struggle. It was not easy. In Romans 7, 21, he tells us, hopefully, okay. Yep, there it is. Oh, nice. Uh, he tells us, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. If Paul can admit it, so can I. I have struggled my entire life with food issues. I showed up in my adoptive family from foster care with very strange food issues. And I'm letting those food issues destroy my body. Not an excuse, but a clear, specific area in which to pursue holiness. Let me be clear, some of those issues are sin. You can't have an area, an area of your life that out, out of balance and not honestly look at the root and find the sin. And at my work, I've had issues at work for months now, and I've been incredibly disappointed with myself with some of my behaviors. Again, those are sins. Uh, those, there's sin in my choices, and I need to identify those specifically in order to make progress. Maybe yours is something physically addictive, like drugs or alcohol. Maybe it's shopping or gambling or inappropriate relationships. Or maybe it's something good, like exercising, that's become an idol. It's essential for you to be honest with yourself and to bring this ugly thing from wherever you've tried to hide it and name it before the Lord. Yeah. What is the specific area in which you can pursue holiness? In the movie, 28 Days, in which Sandra Bullock goes back to rehab for alcohol abuse, Steve Buscemi plays the role of a rehab administrator and counselor named Cornell. In the following excerpt, he gives his AA speech. Cornell. If it'll make you happy, I'll stop drinking. And then I would tell myself, tonight I will not get wasted. And then something would happen, or nothing would happen. And I'd get that feeling, and you know that feeling. Mm -hmm. When your skin is screaming, and your hands are shaking, and your stomach feels like it wants to jump out your throat, and you knew that if anyone had a clue how wrong it felt to be sober, they would never dream of asking you to stay that way. They would say, oh, geez, I didn't know. It's okay for you. You do that amount of coke. You have a drink. You have 20 drinks. Whatever you need to do to feel like a normal human being, you do it. And boy, I did it. I drank and I snorted and I did this day after day and night after night. I didn't care about the consequences because I knew they couldn't be half as bad as not using. Mm. And then one night something happened. I woke up on the sidewalk. I had no idea where I was. I, my head was pounding and my shirt was covered in blood. 
and I'm lying there wondering what happens next till I heard a voice say, ma'am, this is no way to live. This is a way to die. If you've ever suffered from addiction of any kind, you probably recognize these thoughts, maybe not the extreme consequences of, of the hard drugs of the character, but this feeling. And you know that if anyone had a clue how wrong it felt to be sober, they wouldn't dream of asking you to stay that way. They'd say, oh geez, I didn't know. It's okay for you. For me with food, if I get my feelings hurt, if I'm having a bad day or feeling stressed or bored or it's a Tuesday, <laughs> I feel a compulsion to eat junky, sugary, chocolatey food. It makes me feel better. How can that be wrong? Oh, too much food is killing me. That's right. I remember now. Maybe you have a similar compulsion and you see the consequences but it feels like those consequences matter less than the thing you think you need. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where I am. <laughs> oh, that's not good. Oh, oh. 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 Start over, we love it. Do it again. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so, maybe you have a similar compulsion. You see the consequences, but it feels like those consequences matter less than what you need. And you know what? Humans have been telling ourselves these lies since this happened in Genesis 3, 4 through 6. Genesis 3, 4 through 6. Then the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes. The tree was desirable to make one wise, so she took and ate of the fruit. When the conversation started, just like Paul, Eve wanted to do good. She even had the rule memorized, and she shared it with the serpent. But like Paul, evil was right there with her, giving her the message that she shouldn't have to go without anything she might want. Some of you write the second thing that this doesn't apply to you. You don't drink. You would never do drugs in a million years, and you wouldn't have let that serpent talk you into eating that fruit. <laughs> what are you if you cannot think of a single area of your life in which you should pursue more holiness. While there are specific verses about being sober, there are far, far more verses about being prideful and arrogant and jealous and gossiping and unforgiveness and failing to help those in need. In James 4, he goes so far as to tell us that God resists the proud using military language. We like to categorize sins more like crimes, felony versus misdemeanor, or maybe even a white collar crime. Sin is sin, yeah. but like uh, sin like pride or for unforgiveness that God pounds away at in book after book, Old Testament and new, maybe don't think of yourself better than that Steve Buscemi character. My food issues could kill me. Gossip and unforgiveness can wreck a family or a church. And pridefulness and arrogance can disrupt the purpose God has for your life. Is that Genesis? Yeah. Yeah. Remember, we're trying to think of specific areas of our lives when we head down the hill where we can pursue holiness. All right. Um, let's take. Let's go back to Peter and Gethsemane. If you asked Peter directly, he would never have imagined he would have let the Lord down. Remember that first verse and telling us all about how he would stand? Um, he would never have imagined that he was slept when he was asked to watch and pray. He was wanting to do good, but evil was by his side, luring him into a nice, restful nap three times. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. 
redeeming the time, because these days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Too many of us fall into the trap of the enemy of having the goal of appearing holy to those around us. That's actually easier than the work of confronting the hard facts of our lives. Maybe we have a severely broken relationship in our family. Maybe we can't even get along with our spouse or a coworker or a boss. Maybe we can't be alone with ourselves for an hour. We can't help ourselves from sharing critical gossip about somebody we don't like. We don't know why we're so sad or angry or so desperate for control or comfort. I once heard a strange piece of advice that I wrestled with for weeks after. It goes something like, there comes a time in your life when you have to accept that most of your problems were brought on by your own choices. Boy, I didn't like that. <laughs> I immediately started a mental list of all the things that had happened to me. Not my fault, my brain cried. And it's true. I've had things happen to me outside of my control. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. However, the fact that I was so angry and defensive about the simple sentence made me wonder, why was it so important for me to find other factors to blame other than myself for certain parts of my life? You know why, don't you? It's so easy to see in others. I can't blame others for the troubles in my life. If I can't, I may have to acknowledge that I'm making choices that bring me consequences. Why would I fight that? Desire, want, need. I need, I deserve. Why can't I eat what I want? Why can't I buy what I want? Why can't I, in our hearts, until we go home to Jesus, we have desires that seem okay in our own eyes. We must be able to acknowledge that or the enemy has free reign to use that against you. Don't change you're it. You're, you're, one, I think you're, you're one ahead. You're one ahead. One okay. slide ahead. Okay. There you go. Oop, Thank back. you. Back. What does that say? James. James. Go back two, I think. Yeah. Yeah, back a couple of things. People with eyes. I love it. <laughs> What's that say? Matthew. One more. <laughs> What's that say? You haven't clicked it. But that one's Matthew still. Matthew 26. Okay. All or right. Or is it Genesis one? But that's okay. Um, yeah, that's Matthew. All right. Okay. I, I, I meant to do that. <laughs> I wish I had my glasses. Remember Cain? God told him, sin crouches at the door and its desire is for you. You must rule over it, Genesis 4, 7. What was Cain's response? To murder the person he wanted to blame. <laughs> we all have Cain's in our life, don't we? I have a few Cain's that are Facebook friends. They, <laughs> you know them. We are them. <laughs> they post endlessly about their terrible bosses, terrible coaches, terrible family, terrible circumstances, and even the judge in their court hearing and they don't seem to have a hint that maybe some of their own undisciplined desires brought them some of that folly. Mm. What's the cure? Cain should have done, aim his desires at glorifying the Lord. When you make choices for him, ruling over our desires rather than being ruled by them, we're fueling the right side of the fight. Mm. Eating a whole pizza, cheesecake, and a bag of M&Ms isn't gonna glorify the Lord. But if that's what is the desire of my heart, I better be on my knees and in the word and in contact with an accountability partner. Amen. And most of all, dependent on the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. Amen. Then he came to, is this the Matthew? He came to yep. the disciples. Yes. Nice. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Mm. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm. Watch and pray, my sisters. For you enter, lest you enter into temptation. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Try again. Mm -hmm. Where does it have to point? Uh, but each one who is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed, then the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. 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 So why am I being such a bully? Why am I trying so hard to persuade you to find an area of your life where you could use more holiness? 
Because in that recognition that this is a lifelong battle and in the recognition that as long as you have breath in your lungs and want to do good, evil is right there with you. So you will see you cannot be holy without dependence on the Holy Spirit. And that's what we call good news. You need God. God sent his son to die in your place and he left a helper to seal your hope by helping you. Now we come to how. Throughout this book, The Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges mentions some of the tools available to you for fulfilling your purpose in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about a few of those tools and then add a few others for you to consider. But let's review. Let's try to review. One more chance. No? Can they run it for We are pursuing holiness so that we can fill, fulfill our purpose of our lives. We accomplish this by obedience to and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Hmm. If I'm dependent on him, then won't obedience just come from him? No. No. We we cannot be holy without him. However, he won't bring holiness to us without our participation in the plan. We have to do the walking. We can't pray for victory and then fail to walk in obedience and expect his favor. Just ask King Saul. I know it sounds like a contradiction, but submitting to him and depending on him are separate from our personal responsibility to participate in obedience. Jerry Bridges opens his book with a great image of this seeming contradiction. Imagine that you're a farmer or a gardener. This won't be hard for some of you because you're amazing gardeners. Oh, have any of you seen my garden? I really was hoping you could see the slide. Yeah, it's a leech field. (laughs) (laughs) There's, There's no garden. Oh, there is. There is no garden at Casa Connor. Um, anyone care to guess why? Go ahead, Ellicott ladies who know me, say why. <laughs> because I don't plant, I don't water, I don't weed. I received, this is worth it, this is totally worth it. I received a baby Yoda Chia Pet two years ago. <laughs> And I can't be bothered to put the stupid dirt in the stupid yard. <laughs> this is one of the gifts I'm giving away. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I kill all but the most hardy plants inside my house, let alone anything outside. Ironically enough, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> Doing farmer stuff, no joke. My high school mascot was a farmer. (laughs) I couldn't make that up. So I know a real gardener, a real farmer, has to do her part to make the crops grow. She plants, she waters, she weeds, she harvests. And do you know what else she does? Sometimes pays tens of thousands of dollars in hail insurance because there are more things that we can't control than things we can. They, like you and I, have to do our part, and then in faith, we're dependent on the Holy Spirit to actually grow all of the things. We are in control of that seed under the earth. All we can do is our part, and then lean into the Holy Spirit every day to make that seed open, push its way through the dirt, and continue the long journey to the harvest. Mm. So farming and gardening are joint ventures between a person and God, pursuing holiness, is a joint venture between a woman and her God That's right. through the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Philippians 2.13, which every single speaker stole from me. <laughs> For it is God who works in you both to will and to do good, his good pleasure. God is working in you, giving you the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. Galatians 5.16 tells us, I say then, Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Walk in the spirit to do good and not do bad. And in Galatians 5, 22 through 25, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there are no laws. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the spirit... Let us also walk by the Spirit. Did you see that? There's the your action and the Holy Spirit's action. Man's responsibility versus God's sovereignty is one of the mysteries, one of the points of tension in our daily walk. 
One absolutely essential reminder here, we're talking about our purpose on earth as God's children. We're not talking about salvation. I can speak for days about why that's exclusively Jesus Christ. We're talking about walking out the work he's worked in us. Amen. For that, it's requiring obedience to and dependence on the Holy Spirit. What does that mean practically? What does that mean for you as you drive down the mountain and re-enter the atmosphere of your life? The practical tools to grow your garden are called spiritual disciplines. Some of them are called Christian disciplines, and you've heard about them quite a bit this weekend. And so that makes me think maybe the Holy Spirit thinks that's important. Mm -hmm. The author touches on a few of them, but I'm going to give you a comprehensive tour of a holy harvester's tool shed. Mm -hmm. Then you can choose a few to commit to and learn to, to, uh, to, to using when you get home. Um, but because spiritual disciplines are the how, the enemy of your heart knows how important they are and offers a worldly counterfeit for every single holy harvesting tool. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, there's no comprehensive list of spiritual disciplines in one place in the Bible, so I compiled a collection of biblical spiritual disciplines, mostly from the incredible, powerful book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. Um, this is an SOD book, so many of you may know it well. Um, can the AV team get me to the, there's a long list of words. Yeah. There we go. Hey. Hey. Uh, before I show you my list, that was dumb, I just did that. Um, <laughs> I'd like to hear some of the tools you use in your holy harvesting. Yeah? What else? Worship. Worship. Quiet time. Quiet time? Fellowship. Fellowship? Study. Nice. Okay, good. Remember, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and here's my list. Um, we won't look at all of them in depth, but I, depth, depth. I wanted to show you the whole list because I don't know which sin you chose to tackle, and I wanted to remind all of us of the tools we could choose. Let me know afterwards if you see one that you think I missed. Read the word, study the word, and memorize the word. And those are three different disciplines, as we've heard from in uh, great, beautiful detail from some of the previous speakers. Prayer, fasting, worship. Silence and solitude, journaling, fellowship, serving, evangelism, stewardship, and learning and gaining knowledge. Oof, it's quite a list. Maybe all of you do all of those all of the time. But if there's one or two of you in my situation where you have specific sins you're working on, uh, let's take a look. <clears throat> in his book, Pursuit of Holiness, next slide. In his Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges quotes Jay Adams. No. You have sought and tried to obtain instant godliness. There is no such thing. We want to give. Uh, we want someone to give us three easy steps to godliness, and we'll take them next Friday and be godly. The trouble is, godliness doesn't come that way. The same is for true for pursuing holiness. Three easy steps to arriving at holy and not having to worry about it anymore hmm. isn't a thing. But if we want to live in the tension between being dependent on and obedient to Him and our personal choices, here's the real how. Paul tells us to discipline ourselves to be godly, 1 Timothy 4, 7. And spoiler alert, it's not a destination, it's the journey. Mm -hmm. And as many of you have probably heard, Paul was using the Greek language of an athlete preparing to compete in the games. That's a structured, ongoing training. Yep. Uh, the first spiritual discipline is the Word. Next slide. The Word was God-breathed by the Holy Spirit. So dependence on Him is rooted in the Word He inspired. Knowing what he has for us in that book more and more, deeper and deeper, gives us a foundation to build on, rooted in the rock. It gives us concrete guidance of what to avoid, how to come back when we stray, and it strengthens us by building our confidence in what he thinks is important for us to know. If you're sitting around waiting for a holy rush or an inspiration or an emotion, start with what he's already given you. Yes, there are mountaintop experiences, but if you're thirsty, Drink from the well he provided. Mm -hmm. oh. Next slide. We must respond to what the Holy Spirit has already done if we expect him to do more. I'm going to read that one again. <coughs> we must respond to the Holy Spirit, what he is al has already done, if we expect him to do more. There is a Bible sitting in front of you that he gave you God breathed. Start there. Mm -hmm. Plan a time each day or the day will slip by you. Next slide. Uh, reading or listening to the word, this is first, uh, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Say it with me. All, All scripture, scripture is given, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Remember our why to pursue holiness? Here's that purpose. And uh, another one that came with a lot of the speakers. So if you don't have that highlighted in your Bible, take self confrontation. <laughs> <laughs> Study and memorize the word. Don't let the enemy of your heart tell you that you're too tired or too busy. Find the time, just like you do for the friends and the loved ones whom you prioritize. Look for a system that works for you. There's a lot of study methods out there. Ask and investigate. There are many different learning styles, but it needs to be you and the word. Reading is important, but until you actually study the word and hide it in your heart through memorization, it really limits what the Holy Spirit can bring to mind as you walk out those good works. Mm -hmm. Ask yourself how scripture specifically applies to you and how you can be changed by it. And don't forget to look at the scripture through the lens of being a Pharisee or King Ahab. Mm -hmm. There's a natural tendency to want to identify with the good, group, good guys when we often learn the most and grow the most and bring the most glory to God by finding the ways we make the same mistakes as the bad guys, mm -hmm. opening our heart to be changed by the Lord. Mm -hmm. Personally, I was surprised and humbled to find out how much I had in common with King Ahab. And when he was one very terrible king of Israel, um, but I was humbled to realize that the only reason I could never be as bad as he was is God was wise enough to never make me the king of a nation. Mm. Yeah. We have no idea what we would be capable of, giving all the money and fame and power we think we'd love to wield. All right, next slide. Before we leave this collection of disciplines related to the word, I mentioned that the enemy of your heart has provided counterfeits to keep you from using these tools to fulfill your good works. I'm going to pause and have you think for a second about what are some of the counterfeits of reading, studying, and memorizing the words? What do you think that the enemy gives us as counterfeits? TV? Social, social media? media. Self, oh yeah, self-help, that's really good. AI Jesus? AI Jesus? I don't know what that is, but it sounds not good. I don't like it. <laughs> Jesus and then insert it into like Skynet. Like it. <laughs> um, the world and you 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 know it. You can I can hear it in your responses. The world is happy to fill your time and entertain you. It's the Vanity Fair from Pilgrim's Progress. TV, movies, hobbies, social media. Most of these things are not bad, but as a substitute for the actual time in the Word, you're left without one of your most basic gardening tools the Holy Spirit breathed word from your creator. Mm. Spiritual discipline meditation. Excellent. It's not the emptying of your mind as the world wants you to do, Amen. making you vulnerable to the enemy of your heart. Yes. But by focusing on specific scriptures, turning them over in your mind and applying them to your life. I know what you might be thinking. I can't meditate. I can't concentrate. Um, but I have, every woman I've ever spoken to at length uh, will admit that they meditate. They just don't call it that. We focus on conversations and ideas in our head, usually starting around 3 a.m. <laughs> and we can't stop it from rolling around and rolling around. Mm -hmm. Arguments with a spouse or a coworker that happen only in your head but can last for four days. <laughs> Yeah. You do it a lot at 3 a.m. Um, so what if, we, when we were obsessing, we took our thoughts captive, we put off the mental ranting, and used that same energy and emotion to put a scripture into our mind Praise and, and ask how it could apply in our lives? Mm -hmm. What's the counterfeit? I've already alluded to the counterfeit offered by the enemy of your heart. It's meditation. <laughs> Yes, it's the same word, but the world wants you to clear your mind and leave it open to the enemy. Remember in Luke 11, a demon leaves a man's house, but when he decides to come back, he brings seven big ugly friends. Fill that void with the word. Don't make any provision for the enemy of your heart. Next slide. Spiritual discipline, prayer. Volumes of books are written on prayer, but most basically for gardening tools in pursuing our holy harvest, it's just so essential that God made a way to communicate with you. And not only has the king 
allowed a way, but he's actually requested you to communicate with him. <clears throat> Paul went so far as to demand it, pray without ceasing. Name a healthy, thriving relationship in your life in which there's no communication. <laughs> you most probably can't because that's not how relationships work. What's a counterfeit? The counterfeit's a subtle. It's anything you lean on in the world as a solution to your problems. There's nothing wrong with sharing your problems with family, friends, social media, prayer chain, the lady behind you in the grocery store, writing poems, smoke signals. <laughs> However, ask yourself this. Have you taken the trouble to take have you taken your troubles to the Lord in prayer? Not to mention all the other purposes of prayer that are lost when that discipline is replaced with all of the other things of our life. Next slide. Spiritual discipline, fasting. In Luke 11, Jesus talks about fasting. He doesn't make a case for why it's good. He just assumes you're doing it in some capacity, and then he adds some criteria about when you do it. Fasting was a normal part of life for most cultures throughout history. But modern marketing campaigns have convinced us that we need three meals a day, two snacks, and maybe a treat or two. Okay. That's, that's fine at retreat. Don't get me wrong. No, that's not what I mean. But you may have noticed that fasting seems to be making a comeback as half of U.S. adults are either pre-diabetic or diabetic. I'll stop there and let you do your own research on religious, dietary, and medical fasting. But it is interesting that it's making a resurgence. Even the best marketing campaign does not change God or the tools he offers us when we're dependent on him. And what's the counterfeit? No need. Just have a snack and be happy that you never have to go more than an hour without food. <laughs> Spiritual discipline worship. Personally, this is my favorite gardening tool. Shannon did such a beautiful job on Friday night emphasizing praise. Mm -hmm. I love to worship corporately in church, loudly in my car, freely in my house. Worship music is almost guaranteed healer of a bad mood and helps me to get my mind turned to the right things when the enemy has some things for me to meditate on. Mm. I have two extremely important warnings about worship as a, as a gardening tool. Woe to she who lies to the Lord in worship. Worship is one of the only things we can give our Lord from our own possessions. Much of what we give him, he's already given to us. But worship is from us, from our heart. And if you're blindly singing whatever lyrics are on the screen and you're not really thinking about what you're saying, don't. Imagine a tender moment with a loved one, a friend, a spouse, a parent, a child, and you're expressing love and appreciation for them for them, and then just start talking about someone else or something else or reading off of a screen. The reason worship music moves us so much, it was designed by God. So be careful you mean what you say to him in worship. And second, woe to she who only worships in song. Bethany commented on this just this morning. Many of us love that emotional rush that comes with musical worship. But what about being a good employee in a secular job, even when we don't feel like it? What about um, how it feels to do chores when we'd rather do recreation? And I mean laundry. I meant laundry when I wrote this. <laughs> we owe Jesus everything. And how we live our lives, how we live our lives is the real reflection of the worship we have for him. Amen. What's the counterfeit? I think it's obvious what the counterfeit is here. Music and anything we offer in, in sincere worship to God. Have you been to a concert lately or a sporting event? Hands raised high, voices yeah. loud, emotions poured out. You can see the passion and adoration on the faces of those fans. Fans is short for fanatics. fanatics. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sincere worship happening, but it's not offered to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I pray. And I begged God before I got here. I pray for each of you that the Lord would search your heart in search of idols that you worship. Mm -hmm. And that you would surrender those at the foot of the cross, keeping true worship for the only one who is worthy of it. Mm. Amen. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 
<laughs> the rest of this list does warrant our time and attention, but we'll never head back down the mountain if I keep going. If one of these piques your interest or seems interesting to you, feel free to ask me about it or do your own research. They are all incredibly powerful tools as you pursue the harvest of holiness. And remember to ask yourself what counterfeit the enemy of your heart offers for each of the of the disciplines listed. Silence and solitude, lean into that, ladies. They've made the world where we don't even have to be alone with ourselves for a second without white noise and distraction and entertainment. Really consider if you need to be adding some silence and solitude into your life. Journaling, I heard lots of you say that. I'm so glad to be in a room full of nerds. It's just my <laughs> Fellowship, um, serving, evangelism, stewardship, and then learning and gaining knowledge. Um, again, all of these came, a lot of these came from the Spiritual Discipline, Disciplines for the Christian Life um, by Donald Whitney, and he makes a really good case for being well-rounded in what we learn and gain knowledge. It's not just the word is, that needs to be the foundation, but God gave us this world, and we need to understand it. There's a lot to learn from it. Amen. Um, next slide. Holy Habits. I'll close this section on how to be obedient and dependent on the word with a quick word about holy habits. The areas of our life where we find disobedience are often habits that we formed. Putting off old habits and putting on new ones requires discipline. These are the moments when we both lean on the Holy Spirit in prayer for supernatural strength and also take personal responsibility to choose. Next slide. Proverbs 24:16. For though a righteous man falls down seven times, he rises again, but the wicked are brought down by calamity. Because righteous man um, has the spirit in him and the work of Jesus Christ, it does still require him to get up after he's fallen. Remember joint venture? Peter fell down several times that night, but when the Lord met him for breakfast on the beach, he jumped in the water and swam to his savior. Judas was brought down by calamity. Our bodies should be our servants, not our masters. Amen. Next slide, Romans 13, 14. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I actually have this on my grocery list. My husband and I share any list. It's, a, it's an app, and we can put our groceries on there, and so we all just kind of can keep track of it a little better. And I actually put that as the number one item is always on the grocery list so that I remember that I shouldn't be buying anything it's weapons from the enemy. Mm. Putting things, paying for money, and putting things in my body from the enemy. Never make any provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. It, all of this physical holiness requires a combination of dependence on the Holy Spirit and a choice to walk in obedience. Next slide. In conclusion, remember Sunday morning, getting ready to head down the mountain, each to our own garden. This is our call to action. Be holy as I am holy. It requires diligence and effort. It's both a lifelong and a daily task. As we conform in one area, he reveals a deeper place for us to work. To live by the Spirit is to live in obedience to and dependence on the Holy Spirit. There's a balance between our wills, expressed by obedience, and our faith, expressed by our dependence. We started the session off in Yosemite. Peter himself, with massive failures in his rearview mirror, such as sleeping in Gethsemane, chatterboxing during the Transfiguration, and, and denying his Lord, later in life gives us this perspective after he matured. Is there a second Peter? His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us a very great and precious promise so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desire. Did you catch that? Yes. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He made a way for somebody like Peter and Paul and me. That toolbox is available for you. Be holy as God is holy so that you may be about the purpose that he has for you, independence on the Holy Spirit. And if you could go to the final um, title slide. And I'd like to thank you so much, each of you, for your time and attention. And um, I'm going to close in prayer. 
And then I do have just a last couple of gifts to give away. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for Buena Vista and for Young Life and for um, our leadership team and our planning team and our volunteers and our participants and, and our, our time together and our sweet time to worship you corporately, openly, publicly. Mm -hmm. Lord, what a beautiful, beautiful season you've given us. I pray for safe travel for all the women as they head home. And I pray most of all that they are seeking that area of their life that the Holy Spirit is whispering in each of our ear, this is what's next for you. This is what I'd like you to pursue holiness. He's, we know you're making a way for each of us for eternity. And while we're here, Lord, we want to do all the things that you have for us before we enter into that eternity with you. And we just pray if there's anyone left that has a need of a prayer or, or needs to, to know more about turning their lives over to Jesus, that they would that they would come home forward and speak to one of these leaders. And Lord, we just, we just pray that you would end this uh, with beauty and grace and joy and that um, you would really honor um, that time with you on the, on the ride home that everybody would, would find you and seek you and, and know more about you. And we ask all this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing your beautiful heart and your beautiful life in Christ with us. We love you so much. I have two gifts to give away, and um, because this is you, a used gift, <laughs> and it's, it's a set, it's a it's cat grass. This is not an only cheap pet. My husband wanted to fit out, I guess, for legal purposes. <laughs> and because of that, Jenna, this is this is gonna make you happy. Uh, I'm giving you a new root plan over. And Groot's given us the, the heart hug, and the, the Central Campus ladies who took five aspects with me had to teach me because all yes. I have to do is like yes. a claw. Yes. Yes. And, Groot, and Groot looks just like Groot? he's given the heart claw. Oh. Hi, anybody who wants to say a sad note of uh, plan holder? I, I think, is that is Brenda? Okay, Brenda, so these are here for you. And then I have a copy, a new copy. Um, claw heart, heart. Claw heart. <laughs> of the spiritual disciplines for Christian life. I saw this hand at the end in the second row go up first. Um, so I've got that to give away. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Great job, friend. Praise the Lord. <laughs>